know, I don't know if I mean, I want to say
Hello, everyone. We're getting started in just a couple minutes. <laughs> Hello, everyone. We'll be getting started in just another uh, minute or two. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, so we're not getting the other one. Yeah. And so if you have a test on trying to get an adapter to an open. If you think that's me, the division is really great. It's a separate file. Well, um, we Here, and I just want to see this. Hi, Next, wow. Next, yeah. Next, next. Well, I'm going to ask the clerk to scale up. Yeah. I think 14 are going to lock you on from 13. Yeah. That's the people online can see the way you draw. Yeah. Let's go on. Yeah. Yeah. I'll show you how these people are. Maybe a camera if I do that. That'll work. Just like a little webcam. Yeah. 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 That's your only fast cam. Yeah. <laughs> hey, so can you hear me now can you hear me now hello 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 can they hear anything? Uh, I am getting, uh, 
So William Bressing says yes. Eugene Burr says yes. So some people can hear you. He was having problems, I guess. Let me see what I can do with the microphone. Uh, and William, William and Susie say they both can hear you. All right. Yeah, I think this should be a little better. I think I adjusted the settings. Oh, is that audio? Yeah. All right. I think we should nope. be good now. So there's our camera. Okay. And your files are up here. So to start the uh, presentation, I want to do no audio. Well, no, but it turns out. Am I using this one? Yeah, you can use that. Which one are we going to Hello, everyone. Hello. Can everyone take their seats, please, so we can get started? So welcome to the first DBA meeting of 2023. So great to see everybody. I'm Jan Rush, and as of uh, the first of the year, I'm DBAA president, so it's a uh, great. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. It's a great honor, and it'll be lots of fun, I, I'm sure. You're also just elected Speaker of the House. <laughs> yeah, after only 14 votes. <laughs> I'm sure I'd be really good at that. Um, for those of you who are here for the first time, just to let you know, we, we generally gather around seven o'clock, between seven o'clock and 7.30. And then we actually start the program at 7.30. 7 and um, we'll have a little bit of a business meeting for maybe um, 15, 20 minutes to tell you what's going on with the club. And then we'll have our main speaker. So generally um, our main speaker will be starting around quarter till eight uh, or eight. So I thought this was a pretty interesting picture here. It's um, ice halos. And I thought it was pretty, a pretty nice way to, to illustrate the first slide since we're gonna be talking about space weather. But there's beautiful, um, beautiful features you could see uh, that ice creates. So first off, we have a new board for 2023, and I'd like to introduce the members. Um, I introduce myself. Um, oh, you're going to need the need the lights on <laughs> to see people. <laughs> Who turned the lights off? Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Vice President, we have Tom Malasco. Can you stand up, Tom, so everybody knows who you are? Secretary, George Keaton. Yeah. Treasurer, Scott Vanneman. Members at large, we have John Gaskell. Jeff Miller couldn't be here tonight. He's probably on uh, YouTube, so maybe he'll write us a chat or something like that at some point. Uh, Tracy Trapezano is the third member at large. And then we have two permanent members of the board. Um, that's the program chair, Jeremy Carlo. <laughs> <laughs> Coming for life. <laughs> I I, I only meant you didn't need to be elected, but yes, you can. <laughs> As you know, you're you're appointed rather than elected. And our welcoming chair, Brian Lee. And there's a vacancy for the observing chair. Um, so there's one more member that um, hopefully we will fill within the year. So we have a lot going on. We thought we needed to keep you busy in the winter. So we have workshops coming up tomorrow. There'll be two workshops. First of all, at 1.30, a, a workshop for kids and teens. We'll have three types of telescopes set up so you can see different, different types of telescopes. There is still time to register for this. So feel free to do that. And we have a special treat. Sylvie, a new member is going to, who, who is a teen, <laughs> is going to be presenting some of her astrophotography. 
to us so the kids can get very inspired. So um, if you if you have grandchildren or children that you want to bring, it is fine to do that. Um, and we look forward to seeing you. The second one tomorrow will be a talk that uh, given by Alan Purdy on things you can see with a telescope, uh, meaning different kinds of objects. So it's a beginner kind of tour of the different of galaxies and what a nebula looks like and what an asterism is and those kind of things. So we have uh, more than a dozen people registered for that. So we're going to have a very good group. But if you would like to come, um, you're welcome, even if you didn't register. And third, we have on February 25th, we have two more seminars. First of all, observing with Sky Safari. And this will be for basically all levels of observers. If you'd like to add Sky Safari to the kind of things that you uh, would like to incorporate in an observing session, this will be a great workshop. I'm promising it. Gary Trapsana is going to lead it. Um, it'll be great. <laughs> um, and finally, well, not quite finally, February 25th. Also, we have uh, we'll have a workshop on collimating your refractor tel uh, reflector telescope. Sorry. Um, the th this is like we only have one brave person registered for this to date. Now, I know it's more than a month away, and that's probably why, but it's also, this is like eating your vegetables. It's good for you, and it's good for your telescope. <laughs> when it comes to collimation, I'm sure you kind of, uh, if you're a new telescope user, you saw it in your manual, you kind of didn't want to spend a lot of time with it. It was kind of in the back of the, the pack of the telescope manual, so you probably didn't think it was very important. It's really important. So this is a great way to have, to learn how to do it with hands-on help from people who are really good at it. So I hope uh, hope you'll sign up if you're in that category. And finally, on March 4th, we're gonna have a, an indoor uh, uh, workshop on astrophotography. Now I wrote beginner astrophotography here, but I think it's that's still in discussion is actually what they'll cover. So um, stay tuned for, for more information on that over the next month or so about what the agenda will be. And um, Gary, Tom, and Joe Lam are, are leading that. Another event we have coming up, um, we're gonna have a private event at the Mallon Auditorium that Adam Chantry runs. Adam Chantry is a, he's the director of the planetarium and he's a DVAA member. And he's gonna do a, a, a presentation just for us. So, but it's, it won't be, uh, it'll be something you can invite your friends and neighbors and your kids and your wives and your husbands to. It's not going to be, it'll be very accessible, basically. So first he'll do a, a discussion of what's up in the sky. And then um, there was a presentation on the moons, moons, our moon and the moons of um, the planets. So it should be really fun. It's free. We will take a, um, a goodwill donation, but uh, basically it's free. And we're looking forward to seeing you. And that the registration is available for that too. We do need you to register because the, we do have a capacity limit in the planetary. Oops. Where's the planetary? It's at the Arcola Intermediate School in Eagleville. So it's, it's not too far from here. It's... Uh, Maybe a half an hour's drive from here. And finally, we have a block of tickets with Neil deGrasse Tyson, um, his, his show on, um, oops, his show, uh, I forget what channel it's on, Discovery maybe? Um, Star Talk is, is, a, is a show he does. It's been on for several seasons and he usually films it at the Haydn Planetarium in New York, but he's filming it now. Um, in April at the Keswick Theater. So we would be the live audience for that. And we got a block of 20 tickets. There are three left. So if you're interested, jump on the website when you get home and, uh, and buy up the last three tickets. And for anyone who, who uh, doesn't spend much time with our website, just wanted to point out um, that, just go to, go to the website and then there's a whole a list of the upcoming events, and you can click on any one of these to find out more about them or register. 
Okay, a new procedure we're going to have this year. <clears throat> I want to say thank you and welcome to our local outreach captains. Now, you, you know that we, we do a lot of outreach events and we cover a pretty broad geographic area. So this year we thought it would be good to actually appoint a local person in that in each area to uh, to run the events in that area. And so these 10 people, thank you very much everybody have have agreed to be their local captain and the way that'll work is oh this oops emails Email will still go to outreach at dva.org and then that'll come to me and then I'll forward the event to the right captain and that captain will then plan the event with their with uh, the requester. And um, I think I think it's going to be a great way to distribute the work and it takes advantage of the fact that people like to make their local contacts. They like to do the events with their own libraries and schools and, and so on. And you make good local contacts that way. So it's it's a new kind of pilot program, but I'm pretty confident it will be great. And thank you everyone who has volunteered for one of these jobs. By the way, no one said no, and everyone was enthusiastic. So uh, I think it was a, it'll be good. Are these permitted too? They are. Yeah. No. <laughs> You can always move away like another state. <laughs> of course, they're not permanent. We expect everybody to get maybe one or two events per year. It's it's not a really busy, busy, busy job. We overall in the club, we do around 15 outreach events per year, not counting Valley Forge. So 15 maybe is, is uh, typical. Okay. So um, now we'd like to do reports from our... Um, our chairs. Brian, you have a membership report for us? I do. We have, uh, we have um, nine new members this month. Uh, the May family, uh, uh, Kristen, Robert, Kevin, and Lyle. Uh, the Mannings, uh, Scott and Dawn, uh, Demetrius Bone, Vaughn Newton and John Lehman Gruber. And uh, I don't think any of them are here tonight. That but is. if they are, please stand up. That's the least. Yeah. And I hope some of those people will take advantage of uh, some of our clinics. And actually, I already know uh, some of them are coming to the clinic tomorrow. So they're going to take advantage of our, um, our educational opportunities in, for the winter. Okay, Scott, do you have a treasurer's report for us? Uh, I don't have a report itself. <laughs> Hi, my name is Scott Vanderman, and I'm the new treasurer. Um, I don't have a report for this month because we're looking at their, uh, all the financials and things for it, but I thank Luke for all the work that he did, the previous treasurer. Um, I just like to remind everyone to make sure to uh, go to the website and sign up for your membership and renew if you haven't already. Um, if you need any help with it, just let any of us know. Um, if you want to pay by check, just you can either mail a check to us or just uh, hand me the check. So thank you. Thanks, Scott. And Bill McGinney, our camping czar, has a report for us. Czar. <laughs> Started that. Met, made this? <laughs> <laughs> Are we doing everyone? This is this one. Let me do a slideshow from here. Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay. It's been a, obviously it's been a couple, few years since we've done a field trip. Uh, so this year we're not trying to get too ambitious, but we kind of are. We're going to be doing two. And one in the spring and one in the fall. Uh, try to pair, try to put these in areas of the year that uh, we either might not get out as much or it's, we, I still want to do a fall one, but I know there's a ton of star parties as we go down the shoot in October. Um, so, so without further ado, let's go ahead and check out what's on the horizon. 
you do something about it? Well, there's might, not. might not work with uh, Google Docs. That's cool. All right, great. Might just have to do that. Okay. <laughs> So that's we'll the presentation, that everyone. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Make it active. Just go this way. Yeah. Okay. So in for spring, we are looking at doing a field trip up to Cherry Springs um, on April 21st to April 23rd. We actually have rented a cabin, uh, the Big Dipper Lodge, through Frosty oh, was, oh. Frosty Hollows. A bed and breakfast. It's a mile down the street from Cherry Springs. So stay nice and warm in there. The here's a little bit about the facts of the actual event. Uh, since we're running out the whole place, the place technically fits 10 people. I'm not going to say that's going to be a comfortable 10 people. I don't know how it's all going to be laid out, but we can have a, a max capacity on site of 10 people. Uh, the good news is that we're down the street from Cherry Springs. So if, if someone who, for whatever reason, if we do max out that space, maybe one of us or some of us can go down the street and just stay there from that night or the night or a couple nights. Um, but you're gonna have to commit to the weekend right now. I haven't opened it up to individual days, just trying to, trying to get the heads that we need in there first. And then after that, we'll see what we can do. And you yeah. also have a field too. Yes, I'm gonna get to that, yep. Okay. Yep, so this is actually a pretty cool location. Jam found it, Jam suggested it. And the cool thing about it is it, April is kind of, you don't know what you're going to get. Jeremy's so fond of saying that it's going to be cloudy until May up there. Uh, the The temperature range can be anywhere from, you know, sub-freezing to 60 degrees. You just don't know where you're getting. So it's, uh, we'll, have, we'll have a space to stay warm. We'll have a field. We'll have a good sky. And hopefully we just need clear skies. The one thing I will say is electric. I, I've talked to him a couple of times about the electric. I'm still not certain about how the pavilion, how much electric is in that pavilion. So right now I would say uh, be on the conservative side if you're planning on coming, uh, you know, make your own arrangements for any electric you need. But there is electric from the pavilion that we could use. And uh, yeah, let's take, take a look at this guy. So here's the field. And all the images here, I couldn't find any actual good images anywhere, but I did find them on Google. So hopefully this one could take him down. Sorry, Jeremy, if it does. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so this is the, the field. You can see there's a pavilion right there. And then there's the lodge itself. Uh, so it looks pretty good. Uh, 44 is back here. So, you know, you were going this way is counter sport and this way is cherry springs. Uh, so obviously we're not gonna be using that for a fire unless it's cloudy, maybe. Um, inside these you know, are probably the best shots I could get. <laughs> uh, there are, I believe that there's, the way they describe it to me is that three rooms of queen size beds. Again, stuff still didn't add up. So either way, there's um, on the, the sleeping arrangement side, if you have questions or whatnot, feel free to reach me. Just actually, what is my email, Jan? Do I have do I have a camping? camping. I do. Okay, <laughs> camping at dva.org. Uh, just reach out with questions. Uh, at this time, we can't commit to any refunds. I will try to get anyone refunds down the line once we get into this. If for some reason you can't make it up there, um, the club fronted the deposit for this lodge, so. I'm not going to commit to any refunds at this time, but it does occur a week after me. Um, and, you know, this is one of the coolest times of year because you have such a cool sky. You have to work with in April. It's my favorite time, March, April, May. You got just, it, it's such a great time to be up there. Um, between having, you know, if you wanted to take apart part of a Messier marathon or if you wanted to just go galaxy hopping, you have it going on. Okay. Daytime excursions, if you've never been up Cherry Springs. Uh, first off, please join us because it's great up there. Portal 2 skies. Uh, you have daytime, you have some fun stuff you can do. And as we get closer, maybe we'll take a poll and see if any people just want to collectively do some stuff. But if you guys haven't found out about this one, 
um, Fred Woods Trail is a phenomenal place. It's about an hour southwest. Uh, and actually right around there is a, for anyone who likes doing Milky Way shots or astrophotography, there is an actual bald knob. There's a parking area. It's a bucktail. I think it's a bucktail overlook or whatever. Um, buckskin overlook, something like that. And it's just a, a beautiful vista on top of a hill. Uh, you do need clearance to get up there. We drove a friend's Civic up there, and that was one of the most terrifying experiences of my life. <laughs> so don't do that. Roy Have a car with clearance. Roy says, bring, bing, bring bear spray. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> hey, I, I don't make the news. I just report it from <laughs> that, That's a good hike. Uh, there's this beautiful, uh, three beautiful vistas, but this really cool uh, rock city. And Pennsylvania has a number of these. If you go out to um, World's End State Park, they have a rock city up there. But rock city is essentially these giant rocks that you're kind of like walking through the crevasses of. And there's old inscriptions on the side from the early 1900s from when people were up there. It's kind of cool to see. Another great point is uh, many guys have been out to the Rim Trail or to the Turkey Trail out in Colton Point, which is really cool. So Grand Canyon, PA, that's about half an hour, 45 minutes to the east. Austin Dam disaster. That's a cool spot. You should check that out. Um, that's a the drive is about forty five minutes, but it's uh, it's cool when you get in there because you actually see the dam the way it was left. Um, I was been told it's a third worst dam disaster in Pennsylvania. Uh, <laughs> in the state, in the well. state of Pennsylvania, <laughs> and the first or maybe the second round, and the first and fourth were Johnstown. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> The Kinzua Bridge, which is a bit of a haul, it's an hour 15, but it's still really cool to see. I would actually love to get a, a great nighttime shot there. Um, I think it'd be really interesting. They have <laughs> brand new visitors there too. Yes. Uh, that we last summer. It's fabulous. Yeah, it, it's spectacular. Yeah. There, there is a local club in Bradford that gets permission to go down in the valley to shoot because the Milky Way is behind the bridge. Right. Yep. So uh, you kind of have to connect with somebody there and that food. Which uh, I haven't been able to do so far, but that's that's great. Which group is it? I think it's the McKean County Photography Group, but it's, I'm not sure. Okay, all right. Keep that in mind. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah, three nearby lakes for kayakers. I'm looking at the uh, Trevisanos out there, so you have uh, easy access to them. 15 minutes down the road to one, uh, half an hour down the road to another, and about 45 minutes down the road. If you guys like the doing a, a perfect daytime astronomy activity like fishing and kayaking can't get much more laid back than that um and then we'll have any further details i have a detailed listing of things up on the website right now for this actual event question yep uh, where exactly are the accommodations the accommodations are at the big dipper lodge it's a frosty hollow bed and breakfast is one of their facilities it's an hour or i'm not an hour i'm sorry one mile right up north from Cherry Springs. So you take 44, continue along down before you get to the general store. It's going to be on your left. So the lodge has a combination like a hotel or you can bring the No, the lodge, yeah, the lodge will have beds and it should have beddings. Uh, I can confirm any of your questions. So just shoot it to me. Yeah, yeah it, it, it should be, it should have linens and everything. Um, it does, yeah. yeah. Yep. What about the uh, the ice mine? Oh yeah, the ice mine. Yeah, well that's that's on the website. But uh, <laughs> yeah, the ice mine is definitely a place to check out in Countersport. They have the Lumber Museum. Um, you have the world famous uh, <laughs> snow belt of. Yeah. So if there's if people don't feel comfortable actually staying inside, there is. It looks like there's plenty of space outside to tent off. Now I don't want to say here that we can exceed that capacity because we're running it out for 10 people. Right. Um, but, you know, we'll see what goes on. Maybe I can just talk to them and see, you know, additional heads outside, how they feel about it and stuff like that. Um, yes. There's an Elliot Ness Museum in Calderport. Yes, there is. That's a good, one. yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, okay. yep, yep. And you also have the beginnings of the Allegheny River, which is literally a runoff. You cross and it says Allegheny River. Uh, wow. So here we go. This is the money slide right here. Um, so it's 164 ahead for the weekend. And like I said, we're not splitting it out by day at the moment. Uh, as we get closer to date, if we have openings, we'll, we'll split out.
on my day. But right now, uh, pretty much have to commit to the weekend, and you can reserve right there on the website. We are, we're on the website. I'm not seeing it on events. You go to events, you go, it should be for in April. Yeah, and that's, uh, oh, I see it. Yep. Uh, yeah, it should be there in April. Yes. So when you, you say the weekend, and you talk about Friday night and Saturday night? Friday night and Saturday night, yep. Yeah. So we can get in there anytime. Uh, I think it's after three and out by noon. Out by noon. Out by noon, yeah. Okay. So. But I mean, most people are probably going to be, that's probably a pack of time for most people anyway. Uh, but yeah, okay. Let's move on to the fall trip. Okay, so this one happens in the uh, in October and 15th through the 17th. And I know, I don't, hopefully we won't be star party now at that point. So September, we do have the York County and we have um, the Black Forest. And in August, Yes. Um, something else too in August. Like Spruce that. Knob. Spruce Knob. There we go. Yeah. So this is more of this is over at Frank's looking to do something easy for the club to access, something that anyone, you know, we can pack it out as much as we want. Um, obviously, it's at Frank's, so the electric's going to be a little precarious. So you have to definitely bring your own electric uh, solutions for that one. You know, great thing is check in anytime. You know, it's two hours away. We can fit more than 10 people here. Um, the there are some very explicit and, and clear observing rules. So if you sign up for this event, definitely take a look at the observing rules. There's a link on the website to Frank's observing rules. It's nothing you guys haven't seen or done before, but please do read through it. You're observing on private property and out of respect for Frank, it's um it's best to just make sure. We're all on the same page. Um, yeah, Frank also is, he's okay with small camping rules. He's not good with having, you know, a whole, he doesn't want to have any, anything too big that's going to create a mess, uh, draw energy or, you know, just small camping girls are good. Uh, yes, Tracy. Yeah, that'll be right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I don't know where I got those dates. Oh well. Who knows? Um, but yeah, if you haven't been up to Frank's, the field is really it's good. It's uh it's nice and expansive. Um you got your horizons are are nice. The trees absorb a lot of the light on the horizon, so it's it's great. Uh you're right there by some really nice uh, daytime activities in the Appalachian Trail and um, having Hawk Mountain, uh, there's plenty of lakes around. Uh, so, and of course, this private drive, um, you'll see a little sign probably as you drive by it. <laughs> so, <laughs> yep, exactly. And so this one is, I think it's a great finish to the year. Uh, you know, we have one more event together as a club. These, this uh, allows you to check out, you know, it's the end of summer and the very beginning of autumn. And also one of the cool things is you have hawk migration going on right at the same time. So daytime, fence you will go down Hawk Mountain and get to check out, see some of the big birds flying around. And, um, and yeah, and of course you can have plenty of people on the field. Okay, I already mentioned some of these, these the things around. Uh, Frank's uh, any mountain bikers in the area, Trex is a really great spot. So it's a really fun spot. All right, money slide. Money slide. 15 bucks, all donation to Frank. Uh, thank him for using the field. That's just in line with the Cherry Springs rate. And, uh, you know, obviously, we'll have responsibility for that. But you do, I do encourage you and I do uh, hope people sign up online because it, it, all that, that $15 is going right back to Frank and supportive whatever he needs to take care of his field. So why do you want to attend? Uh, you know, it's great. It's great being out there because you get to be at the club. You get to be at there. You get to build friendships. You get to learn about astronomy. You get to learn about why Jeremy likes looking through eyepieces versus Lou, who's going to want to sit there in front of a laptop the whole night. Uh, <laughs> you, you get to, you get to learn new tricks. You get to see what people do. You get to see some of the hacks people make. Um, it's really cool 
to just hang out kind of during the daytime. You get to know some of your fellow DVAers. Uh, you, you know, you can bring all your camping gear, bring instruments, bring whatever you want and just have a good fun time because you're you're out just nerding out under the stars. Um, it's a picture of Gary and Nate back when they were playing up at Frank's, I think. Yep, yep. Um, this was the last time we did, this is the last time we did Frank's and then Cherry Springs. We had our uh, one of our main sequence star parties up there. And yeah, so go to the website and learn more about these events. The events are listed under the, in. so if you go to the website and go April or go to October, you can register right at the event. I encourage for the, for the April event, um, definitely we need registrations on that. Um, so if you're interested, if you're excited about it, you got a warm spot to stay and you can, you know, come out and set everything up and then go inside for a little bit and then come back out and, uh, you know, it should be a good time in April. Yes. Don't provide meals for everyone staying there, but we'll use them now. Kind of no, 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 it's just literally we're running out of lodge. Okay. Um, so the bed and breakfast is a little misnomer because they have the bed and breakfast facility. They have two of them, I believe. Um, but this is just an actual house. So it's an house they purchased that they rent out. So we'll be bringing the food. Yep, we'll be bringing the food. So um, that price isn't inclusive of any food. It's just the rental price for the actual stay. What's glamping mean? Glamping is when you go camping, but not really. <laughs> <laughs> There's no roughing it with glamping. <laughs> okay. I'll... Can I bring my 30 question parameter up there? I'm. 35 foot. <laughs> That's small. It, it, that, that property is going to be pretty expansive, I think. Oh, but, wow. Yeah, no, I know. But I mean, if. Uh, you know, I encourage if you're interested in coming up, it'll be great to have you'll be able to set everything up and just not have to worry about it and you know and leave it around for two days and we'll be good to go. So all right, Jen. Turn it sounds back great. <laughs> Early late to sign up. Thanks. And Bill, I think you, you have a wait list on that um April event, right? I think there's a wait list there. Is it? I think so. I, I don't. I didn't think I saw. It was so oh, there is a no, but it, there it's it's activated. So if we get more than ten, yeah. go ahead and sign up. You'll be on the wait list. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's possible if we get too many, we could rent that place across the street. But we don't want right. to. We don't want to do it until we know how many people want to come. Right. So there is a level of different lodge across the street, but of course it's all contingent on you know. Whenever you're looking at places up in Cherry Springs, uh, the dark sky weekends go really fast. So whenever you're looking at places up in Cherry Springs, the dark sky weekends go really fast. So the later we get, um, we're not going to have overflow because people are just going to grab them. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever looked at Airbnbs up there, but they go like that once people start planning out their trips. Uh, so hopefully, just go on there if you if you know, like Jan said, we have a wait list. We have wait lists, yeah, for that guy, not for the, the uh, for Frank's, obviously. But um, if you have questions about that trip, just hit me up, camping at bva.org, and go from there. Thanks, Jen. Okay, thanks a lot, Bill. All right, now I'd like to turn the meeting over to our permanent programs chair, <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy Carlo. Oh, Lou, you want to talk? So sorry. In fact, I said other. Other. By the way, we have 25 people online. All right, now we have Lou Varvarezis, uh, astrophotography. Okay, for all of you guys that are interested in astrophotography and uh, experience or don't have any experience, uh, we have workshops uh, we hold once a month. It's usually, well, it's almost always the Wednesday before this meeting. And I'm hoping as uh, attendance uh, continues to increase, we might uh, uh, do this more than once a month. But right now it's on a once a month basis. Last, uh, the last one we had, uh, we did some, uh, Gary presented for us uh, 
some tutorial uh, on uh, PixInsight and how to use different uh, tools. Uh, next month, we haven't uh, decided exactly what we're going to do yet, but we'll, I think we'll, we'll have an open session. If anybody has any questions about any aspect of astrophotography, this is where you get your questions answered. Um, you know, we have a bunch of experts there that um, from uh, experts from planetary photography, planetary imaging, deep sky, wide field, all aspects. Uh, also, um, I'm thinking next uh, next month that uh, we had some people that are that requested a, a, tut a tutorial on planetary imaging because last month we had uh, our guest speaker from the island of Cyprus, uh, Agapius, um, take some images of Mars for us because we were socked in under clouds here. It comes in pretty handy when you have somebody that has sub arc second skies almost uh, 365 days out of the year. So he has left data for us on the forum and Gary posted it. Uh, it's the probably the first thing under the pinned uh, post on the top, if you're interested in processing any Mars data. Um, I finished processing uh, a processing at once and the seeing uh, the, the image came out great because the seeing was amazing and that's the one thing with uh, planetary imaging it's all about the seeing at any rate uh we started 7 30 look for the look on the calendar for the uh, link uh and i usually don't post it uh until a week or two beforehand but it's almost always the same link so if you were there last time use the same link and we'll get you there uh the next time all right that's all i have thank you very much Barbara. going once going twice okay. all right so first i'll give a little update on uh, upcoming uh, programs i've been busy the last uh, couple of weeks so i didn't write anything down so let's see if i can do this by memory uh, next meeting will be February 3rd, and we're going to have Amber Stuver from Villanova University. Uh, she gave us a presentation a couple of years ago. She works for the LIGO collaboration, so she'll be talking about gravitational waves, giving us an update on what's happening with that. Uh, March is a TBA. I'm still working on that. Uh, in April, actually just set this up today, we're going to have Michelle Thaler from NASA. So she's uh, probably going to be presenting remotely to save the trip up here from uh, Maryland but she'll be talking about uh, some things going on, possibly about uh, the Webb Telescope. In May, we're going to have John Honka, who you might know. He's a member of the Chesmont Club. He's also very active up at Blue Mountain. He has a 24-inch F3 homemade scope. He's got uh, night vision optics, a Malin cam, a whole bunch of other things. That's going to be really cool to hear about in May. Then in June, we're going to have another returning champion. We're going to have Steve Connard, who uh, worked on the New Horizons mission. He actually lives up near uh, Wellsboro now, so he's actually going to be coming down uh, to talk to us. Uh, that's what I have scheduled so far. Uh, we do have John Conrad. He'll be coming back uh, later in the year. And actually, our ex-president, uh, Harold, he'll have a presentation that he'll be giving at some point, and I may have one as well, so we'll, uh, we'll see how that goes. All right, so tonight, I'm very happy to have uh, Lou Rue giving a presentation uh, to us. So I've known Lou for about 10 years, actually mostly through uh, amateur radio. So Lou is a weather spotter and also a certified meteorologist. So he did his degrees at uh, Drexel and Villanova and also has a certificate in meteorology from Penn State. He was a software engineer with IBM and I think a few other companies as well. Uh, he's now retired, but he's uh, working as a fire police lieutenant in West Norriton and a fire police sergeant in Lower Providence. So if you get stopped at an accident site or something, you might see him uh, waving the traffic along. But he is also a weather spotter. So kind of the interesting link here is that we drive long distances looking for really good weather. Lou drives really long distances looking for really bad weather. So typically every spring he's out in Kansas and Oklahoma and places like that uh, looking for those tor uh, tornadoes. Uh, Lou is also the Skywarn uh, weather spotter coordinator for Eastern Pennsylvania through the National Weather Service. So I thought it would be cool to have Lou here. He's kind of a, a walking textbook on 
all topics related to the weather. So he's going to tell us about weather forecasting for astronomy. So please join me in welcoming Lou Rood. This up. I guess I can use this. Everybody can hear me okay? Yeah. Gotta find the mouse here. Okay, so which button do I forward is the lower one? That makes um, sense. So we're gonna take, yeah. <laughs> right. Okay, so uh, I'll be honest, as Jeremy alluded to, I, I spent a lot of a lot of attention to the weather and not quite as much to astronomy. So I may say some things that aren't quite right, but uh, hopefully I get the weather right. And I have my my storm chasing partner Ed Sweeney here to correct me if I make a mistake. So uh, the weatherman always gets it wrong, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I'll believe. It. <laughs> Okay, so uh, the topic here is weather and astronomy. Um, Jeremy gave you a lot of information about me. I've been a weather enthusiast pretty much all my life. Uh, I go way back and I'm gonna show my age by this Hurricane Donna, which uh, hit the, um, the entire East Coast in 1960. And um, it, it was a hurricane all the way up the coast. And it's, it's still the only storm that ever did that. So, uh, so that got me interested in weather and I've been doing it ever since. I, as Jeremy said, I'm educated in physics, computer science, weather forecasting. And um, my, my main job for the longest time was a computer, computer scientist, computer programmer, computer support, that kind of stuff. But uh, I'm now retired. I've been a, a storm chaser since 1998. And storm chasing is, a, is really a hobby. Some people make money at it, but uh, but you know I, I just do it as a hobby. Um, I'm active in emergency services. In addition to the fire police duties, I also work with the uh, amateur radio uh, emergency services. Um, I'm uh, a member of the. Um, sorry, I think it's her sharing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm a member of, uh, of the. Emergency Operations Center at my local township in, in Lower Providence, um, which mostly is just a planning thing. But then if something does happen major, then I'll get involved in that. And uh, in addition to all the other stuff that we've, we've listed here, I do storm damage surveys to assist the Weather Service. I do it in coordination with the National Weather Service. And, um, you know, if, if um, a storm hits, does damage, I'll call them up and say, hey, you need any help? And uh, they'll uh, usually say yes, and they'll thank me profusely for help, for helping out because it gets really busy sometimes. Uh, so I've been really busy with all the severe weather that's happened in the last couple of years. Um, okay, and that's not doing anything. I got the did a last way. Okay. Okay. Okay, um, so astronomy, according to what Jeremy told me, that like clouds are your nemesis. Mm. You, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm gonna say a lot about cloud forecasting. That's pretty much most, mostly what I'm gonna talk about here. Um, so what, and I'll cover those topics there. What are clouds? Um, how do we know the clouds are there? I mean, I know like if I look up at the sky, I see clouds, but you wanna know from a forecasting and weather perspective, you want to know more than what you could just see. So, you know, so, so how do we do that? Um, and how, how do you forecast them? I'll go through that a little bit. Um, and then there's some other things that, uh, that will also obscure your vision, which don't really look like clouds, but they're still sort of important things to, to understand. And then um, since the last DBAA meeting I was at was uh, July 23rd, I believe, in 2021 at the Fort Washington State Park. And um, that's been a, a severe weather hotbed recently. So I just sort of want to go over what happened since that meeting um, and show you some of the pictures of what happened uh, there in 2021. Um, 
So what are clouds? It sounds like a real simple, simple question. And it really is. It's, it's atmospheric moisture that basically condenses. So it goes from uh, a water vapor state to a, to a liquid state, okay? The particles um, are really tiny, but they, once they're large enough to actually be visible and there's enough of them, then they're a cloud. Um, they occur when, when some part of the atmosphere reaches saturation, okay? And what it, saturation is, um, you know, basically, the air temperature is equal to the dew point. That's when your your condensation is 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 winning over evaporation because there there's always condensation and evaporation happening in the atmosphere all the time. So um, you're going to get your clouds typically when you reach saturation because then the condensation wins out. You get these particles that get visible. Um, clouds can be liquid. They can be water. They can also be frozen. They can be ice crystals. Um, but, but there's still a, a saturation or near saturation condition there. They can be thick or thin. Um, and for astronomy, I know that's important because even if they're thin enough that people can't really see them, you guys can still see them. So, you know, so, so that's an important thing as well. Um, they're generally formed when the particles are basically, there's some rising motion with the particles, okay? Uh, because that's that's what basically enhances the condensation, and they and they basically condense into the into um, into more into clouds. Uh, vertical motion can happen from all sorts of things. You've seen cold fronts, warm fronts. They push the air up. Um, air goes over a mountain. Um, that's what orographic lift is. Uh, differential heating. Um, you know, and then the, the one of the ones that is a lot harder to predict is actual convection. So you got these these little things bubbling up and they don't push, push the air up and you'll get some clouds out of this. Okay. okay. So there, they, there's some, some basic cloud types. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but they, the cumulus clouds are usually so, sort of on the low side. They're also a little bit convective. So basically they, the, the air is pushing up rapidly enough so you get those bubbly type clouds. Um, the good news with those is that they usually don't cover the entire sky. So, you, you know, you can still see through it. Um, stratus clouds, on the other hand, stratus clouds are usually this deck of gray clouds that you see, and they're, they're pretty low clouds. Um, you know, and that, that would be, I mean, you can't see the sky when they're stratus clouds. Um, the other kind is uh, cirrus clouds. Cirrus clouds are the really high clouds. They, they can look like what these look like, really wispy things. They also might be a little bit bubbly because there might be a little bit that's pushing them up a little bit. But, but the, um, you know, the cirrus clouds are really thin. And, you know, a lot of times they're just going to call that clear skies. But for you guys, that's not clear skies. For astronomy, it's not clear skies. So. So that, those are the kinds of things that are also important to, to forecast. Um, so in order to figure out how you're going to forecast clouds, you need you need data. You need to know where the moisture is. You need to know where the lift is. You need to know um, where there are already existing clouds. Um, so um, how do we how do we figure that out? Okay. Um, and the reason we need to figure that out is because we have forecast models and people with just experience trying to figure out based on that data where the clouds are going to go, where they're going to pop up, where, where they're going to be, where they're going to move. So we have forecast models to do that. Um, and we collect data and feed it into the forecast models. Okay. Surface data, which actually is a little bit useful for forecasting clouds, but not as, as useful as some of the other data. But surface data about the state of the atmosphere at the surface is all over the place. We have these things called ASOS or AWOS, which you usually see at airports, um, which collect all sorts of data, you know, weather, temp weather uh, current weather, temperature, dew point, humidity, uh, air pressure, all that stuff you can get at, out, of the, out of one of those stations. Uh, there are these things called mesonets. If you drive along the along the turnpike at spots, you'll see a little weather station right along the turnpike. That's part of the Pennsylvania mesonet. So there's mesonets all over the place. You get, you get data out of those. 
And even if you have a personal weather station, I was talking to some, some of the people here who have a personal weather station. Um, if you register it correctly with the weather service, they will actually use your data as part of their data set, which is smart. Um, and the, uh, the program is CWOP, C-W-O-P, if anybody wants to look into that and see if they, if they want to get registered, get their, their data on there. It's got, got to pretty much be an automated station to get it to feed to them, but, but it's, it's one way you can help out. Um, all these data go into something called, these data plus, plus more that I'm going to describe a little bit later, all go into something run by the, uh, the weather service called MATIS. Uh, meteorological simulation data ingest system, okay? In addition to the data being fed into there, it also does quality control on it and, and et cetera, to make sure that, you know, these are good data to feed into the, the models and that kind of stuff. Um, over land, I mean, you know, with all these data, data points, the ASOS, the mesonets, the personal weather stations, a whole bunch of stuff. It's a really dense, um, dense, uh, set of data that so that's really useful we, we you know we get a lot of data about what's happening at the surface problem is to figure out clouds you really need to know a lot more than that in fact to figure out most weather you need to know more than that so but, but there's a there's a picture of um that's the matis um surface plot okay and uh if you zoom in you'll actually see more data points and that kind of stuff um, and so you can actually look at the data and, you know, and see it, it tells you whether it has quality control and everything else. So, so it's available to, for you to check, make sure your data is making it, that kind of stuff. Um, but that's just, like I said, that's just one of the things you need. Um, so what, what's also really important is upper atmosphere data. And there's a lot less ways to get upper atmosphere data than there are surface data. Um, it's, uh, one of the main ways that you get data about what's happening in, in the upper atmosphere is you set up a balloon. You know, everybody's familiar with weather balloons, I hope. And what these weather balloons are is a big helium filled balloon and it's carrying a little, little instrument pack and a radio. And this thing, and I think all, all the recent ones are now GPS enabled too. So, so they're really pretty easy to follow. But, um, you know, you send up this balloon and it keeps reporting the data that, that, it, that it's getting. It's getting the air temperature, the humidity, um, air pressure, and all that stuff. And it's transmitting it back down to the surface, to a, to a station that's receiving it at the surface. Um, the, they're actually pretty cool, except if you, if you notice, there's only like 92 places in the U.S. and territories that they send up balloons. So it's not not a lot of data for the upper atmosphere. <clears throat> the other thing is that they're only launched like every 12 hours, um, except in special cases. But normally, operationally, they're launched every 12 hours. Question? Yeah. Uh, what, what's the recovery mechanism? Well, um, there, there really isn't one. They actually, the, the instrument pack will have a label that says you can send it back, but they don't get a whole lot of them back. You know, these balloons go up, the balloon eventually bursts, the, the, the instrument pack lands somewhere. What's the lifespan of the balloon? What's the lifespan? How long do they last? Uh, well, I mean, they're basically, they're, they're one launch. And if they get them back, they can refurbish them and, make, and use them again. But generally, they're, you know, they're, they're only... take a day to, to collect them? Oh, uh, no. Well, actually, see, I have it there. Um, it's... Down. Okay, I didn't, I didn't have it. it, it usually, it, it, it'll take over an hour to finish. It's, it's, it's a wow. set, you know, a good okay. bit over an hour. Sorry, I, I thought I put that on there, but I didn't. Um, but... Because it's getting up into these winds that are that are uh, screaming along at 50 knots or 100 knots or whatever, it never ends up where it, where it started. You know, it's always going to go somewhere. It can go and you know, typically they go up to 120 25 miles away from where they were launched. Um, and they how all, long do they collect data for? 
how does it how long does one hold it? I mean basically they collect data as long as as long as the the instrument works <laughs> you know I mean what happens is eventually that the balloon pops and it and it falls down and at that point it's it's going to stop transmitting data but I I don't know the answer to that I don't know if you know yeah. I mean, they're not real heavy, you know. They're, they're not real heavy. They're, they're, you know. Okay. Yeah. Is that every 12, 12 hours, every single day, all the time? Yes. 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 And like I said, sometimes they will, they will send them up more often. Um, in cases where they're trying to get data about like severe weather that's happening or whatever, they'll send them up more often. But most places only do them once every 12 hours. Is there any automated thing that just sends them up? Or maybe it's like a computer way to send them up. Like, okay. there, is there any automated like no. robot sending uh, them up? No, no, it's people. Uh, yeah, yeah, they. <laughs> can, can you repeat because there are people on the internet who can't hear? Oh, oh, okay, sorry, sorry, yeah. Um, how far back do you want me to go? No, I, <laughs> um, his question was, um, sorry, repeat your question again. I, I just asked if that was automated, like in any way, if there was robots sending those things up every 12 hours as opposed to people, because it seems like it would be very tedious. Yeah, so, so the question was, are, is there an automated system that sends these up or is it people? And there are actually automated systems that can be used, but all of these are basically people. You know, I mean, they want to make sure it gets up. They want to make sure everything goes goes as well with it as they can. So, so they will send this up with people. Question: Once upon a time, they used rockets to collect data. Well, it, I mean, there's a lot of ways to send up instrument packs. I, I, they, the, the primary way that they do it is with these uh, balloon-operated gray wind cells. That's what they send them up. With. Um, so, um, all of the ocean. They they could follow the ocean, yeah. I mean, they follow wherever the winds take. You know, it'll hit somebody. What's that? It'll fall and hit somebody. It it could. It it. I don't think there's ever been a report of that. And for the most part, they don't get them back. Um, occasionally, somebody will actually find a place of the a piece of the balloon, and they'll send that back. You know, I mean, it. it but yeah, in general, they don't expect to get these back. And they don't expect them to hit people, but obviously they could. But um, you know, I, I've never heard of it happening. <laughs> so you know, there's nothing that prevents that. I mean, they're, they're not they're not coming down on a, on a parachute or anything. They're just coming down. So yeah. Well, no, I mean they, they, they are they are launched from. 92 places across the U.S. and and, and some some are in the territories, but 92 places. So like they'll launch them right in the middle of the country. You know, they, they launch them launch them from St. Louis, Missouri. That's probably not going to make it to the ocean. You know, but they um they they they, they um they're not real big. Um, the 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 actual instrument pack is not real big. It could hit somebody. It probably does. You know, I mean, the chances of it are, are slim enough that they, uh, you know, I've never heard of it happen. So, anyway, any other questions? Okay. Um, so, anyway, it, that's, that's, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I was wondering if there's any instrument that quantifies a cloud's moisture content. Well, not. Repeat the question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the question was, are there any instruments that quantify the cloud's moisture? I, I mean, the cloud's moisture is basically what, it, you know, it, it, like a balloon is going to do that, okay? But if it goes through a cloud, it's probably not going to go through a cloud, so it's going to give you the atmospheric equivalent, which is, are you saturated or not, uh, et cetera, you know? I mean, it, there, there's... I'm sure there are instruments. I don't know if Ed knows of any that can actually get that they can actually put into a cloud to get readings. But I mean, you know, it's saturated moisture, so there's not a whole lot to get from from doing that. I don't think. So. Okay, uh, I guess I can move on here. Um, again, they collect sort of standard meteorological data, um, and see, I see this as 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 an issue, which is I send up a balloon at point A. Okay, it gets me data at point B, point C, point D, point E. 
Um, you know, so you're not getting a really uh, coherent set of data. Um, you know, you're getting data that's that's traveling all over the place. You're getting readings of things that are traveling all over the place. So it's not, it, you're going to look at it as if at, it, when you look at the data, it looks like it all happened at the same place, but it didn't. It may, may have traveled up to 125 miles away. Isn't that what the GPS does for you? Well, it, it, yeah, it does. But um, I mean, that tells you where that information is, but that's all <laughs> got to get fed into this MATA system and, and rectified. And that's a more recent thing. It used to be they, they, didn't, even, they didn't have GPS. So they had to guess where these, where these readings were coming from. Sorry, so I have two factoids for you. Payloads cannot exceed a package uh, weight size ratio of three ounces per square inch. Six pounds total for the entire craft. Okay. So the terminal velocity on that basically is, it's like throwing pennies off the Empire State Building. It'd sting a little bit, but it would never kill you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> Did they hear that online or do I have to repeat that? I'm a loud person. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So anyway, what happens when you send up these balloons is you plot the data, okay? And this this chart here is something that weather people understand, but most other people don't. But it's called a skew t diagram, um, and it's actually really useful stuff because I can look at this and pretty quickly quickly tell you where I think the clouds were um, or more likely to be um, when this balloon went, okay? Um, I don't know if there's a good way to do this for the people online or, or here. I think there's a use the mouse. Okay, I, I, okay, so but I can't see the presentation here. Yeah, yeah it's the mouse will be on the other screen. Oh, so I have to look up and use the mouse. Yeah, that makes it tricky. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, you can. Okay, there you go. Well, I'll try and do this. Sorry, but sorry about this. It's going to be a little bit rocky, but there's, there's... okay. So, um, okay. so, so if you look at this, the, the air temperature is the line. If you look up a little further from where the, where the mouse is, it could disappear. Um, but anyway, um, the, the left hand side is the, um, is the dew point. And the right hand side is the air temperature. Okay, going up on the on this this graph. Whoop. This is really tricky. <laughs> okay. You want a pointer? Yeah, I mean the people on the, the I, I have a pointer. Okay, but the people on people on the internet won't see a pointer, but um but anyway, I'm going to I'm going to present it here. They might actually see it. I'm not tall enough. But anyway, the line that's over this way is the air temperature. The line that's over that way is the is the dew point. Right? Is it green and red? Is that the color? Yeah. Colored lines. Yeah. So I'm not always sure what color I'm looking at. So the red is the temperature, and the green is is the dew point. Okay. And um, you can see at the lower Lower end there, the um, the red and the green are real close to each other. So I expect low clouds here. Okay. And the reason I expect low clouds here is because that's basically saturated air. It's close to saturated or it is saturated. So you have low clouds. This this uh, <coughs> excuse me. This sounding, the call sounding was taken at uh, 12 Zulu, 12 UTC. Uh, this morning at Pittsburgh. So there were a lot of low clouds at Pittsburgh. And we could go back and check that if you wanted to. But I'm pretty sure there are a bunch of low clouds at Pittsburgh um, at um, 7, 7 a.m. East, Eastern Standard Time. So um, it's also probably like some, maybe some, some high cirrus, but uh, once you get up to the real real upper upper parts of the atmosphere, it gets really dry because your your dew point gets really far away from the from the air temperature. So so the clouds of Pittsburgh this morning were all pretty much low clouds. 
low to mid, mid not even mid clouds, but you know, pretty much low clouds. So um, there's also a bunch of other stuff on this chart, which uh, I'm not gonna go into unless somebody really wants to get, get a, a total tutorial on this. I can probably do that another time, but, but basically for, for as far as cloud forecasting, you need that information, and then you also need information on um, what the winds are doing. Okay, and if you look at this, uh, I don't know if everybody knows how to read wind barbs, but the wind barbs basically show that pretty much all the winds are coming generally out of the west. Okay, um, in Pittsburgh, it's probably there's probably not a lot of mountains to the to the west of Pittsburgh, so you're not getting any lift from the mountains, but you know, there's there's some other things that 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 might be causing some lift at that point. But at any rate, at the low level it probably also already has clouds. Um, in fact, I know it did. So, so anyway, uh, that's that's what happens when you send up a balloon. You uh, you get a, you get a diagram like this. Okay, and it's considered basically all of this happened at Pittsburgh, even though that thing uh, that that balloon was in. West winds of 35, 40, 50 knots as it, got, as it went up in the atmosphere. So it traveled pretty good at, during, during its life. But they still call that the Pittsburgh sample. So. Okay, the other thing is if, if, if you notice here on this chart, everything, those numbers on the left are, uh, are pressure altitudes in millibars. The pre pressures in millibars, and as they go up, you're going up in altitude. So, you know, at the surface, you're generally close to a thousand millibars, unless you're in some place like, uh, like Denver, where you're at 850 at, at the surface, but generally close to it. So, Pittsburgh is close to a thousand millibars, which is about what you can expect. Um, a thousand millibars, you go up a little bit. Eight hundred fifty millibars is about five thousand feet, give or take. It it varies because the five hundred millibars is not always at the same altitude, but eight hundred fifty millibars is sort of generally five thousand feet. So like Denver is known as a mile high city, and that's you know that means that's why you, when you say Denver, you say Denver's at eight fifty millibars because it's a it, the eight fifty millibar level is usually right there at Denver. So, uh, so you're up a mile for 850 millibars. Uh, you're sort of up two miles when you go up to 700 millibars, or close to two miles, and then you keep going up from there. So, um, and all of these things are things that you need to know, um, you know, to figure out uh, what's happening at the various levels of the atmosphere. Um, and you need to know the actual altitude, not these estimated altitudes. Do they, do they run into these things later in terms of the aircraft? Say that again. Are they worry that these things could interfere with aircraft. Are you talking about the, sending up the balloons interfering, interfering with aircraft? It, it it's always possible. It's it, they they are well known entities going up, so they would typically not rail an air an aircraft airport airplane close enough to to be in real serious um, you know risk of that. But uh, it certainly it certainly could be possible. Okay. In addition to the balloons, another way you can get data, and you get some some good data, but again, it's sort of limited uh, in the same way that the balloons provide you some limited limited information. And that is, you have satellites. Um, most of the well, the satellites that give you a lot of good data are geosynchronous satellites. Um, there's a go goes east and it goes west. Um, and both of those provide a lot of data, especially the more recent GOES satellites, because the more recent GOES satellites have a lot of different channels pulling down a lot of different wavelengths. Uh, well, well, not pulling down, but basically registering a lot of different wavelengths. And you get a lot of interesting data from, from all those sensors that are reading all the different wavelengths. The older satellites usually only had like five sensors on them, but now we have was it 12, 14, something like that? Yeah. And you get a lot of interesting data and you can actually combine the data and get some really interesting pictures. But um, all of these data are actually also fit, fit into MATIS. So MATIS is, is the thing. As long as MATIS stays up, everything else works a whole lot better. Um, and I, I, 
I don't think Metis ever fails. I mean, I think it works really well. So um, the key fields for cloud forecasting, I think, are, are really provided by the water vapor loops. Um, the old ghost satellites only had one water vapor channel. Uh, these now have three, upper level, mid-level, and low level. And you can see the, uh, the wavelengths that, uh, that are at the center of those, those sensors. Um, so upper level, 7.3 micrometers is, is the wavelength that is, that is registered. And with that, they can actually get some good data from, I'm not gonna go into all the physics about how the, the wavelength tells you, you know, exactly what's happening, but you, you get water vapor that's actually emitting things in those wavelengths, basically. Um, so, so you say upper level and low level, that means levels in the atmosphere? That's that's correct, yes. Yeah. The yeah, upper level is the upper level of the atmosphere, and then low level is low level of the atmosphere, um, et cetera. Uh, the trick is, especially like the lower the lower level, if there's clouds in the upper level, it, it, these things can't can't really get good readings through the clouds. Similar to, to astronomy not being able to look up through the clouds, a lot of these things can't look down through the clouds. So there's there's that's one limitation. Um, water vapor data. They actually don't give much information about the exact altitude of what it's reading. Okay, there are some some uh, algorithms it runs through to, to, to estimate it, but it doesn't actually give you the exact altitude. So again, you, you sort of have to guess that. Um, and but if you combine that with with information from soundings and everything, then you get you get much better information. Okay, there's some other sources. None none of these are. are particularly um, robust, but pilot reports, all these planes that are flying around, um, some of them actually have automated instruments that they will actually send back weather data. Uh, a, a lot more of them are actually verbal pilot reports that they'll, they'll read their instruments and send them back. They usually don't, the pilots usually don't do that unless they're asked, you know. So, so they're they're a little bit like I said they're not quite as robust because they don't happen all the time, and um, you know they're, they're they're it really depends on where the planes are. So you're not getting as as much of a, a picture of the atmosphere with those, but they help. Okay, so to forecast clouds, you can take all this information from you know from the surface and from from the upper upper levels of the atmosphere. And you got to figure out where, where the clouds are and where you think they're going to be. Okay, so you're looking for where are the clouds going to break up because the saturation is, is going to dissipate, it's going to mix out. Um, where are the uh, um, you know, where are clouds going to form? So so where where is the uh, uh, the atmosphere going to approach saturation? And that can happen at any level of the atmosphere and any time during the day. Um, you know, so you're, 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 you're actually trying to figure out all that. Another thing is like, if you have an approaching weather system, that'll, that'll basically help to intensify the clouds. It'll put more moisture in and you can, you can approach saturation in that, that way. So, um, most, most cloud forecasts, and you may have seen this in some of, some of the apps, most cloud force forecasts pretty much just give you a percentage of sky cover. They don't give you much more than that. I know there's a one app that, that Jeremy told me about that a lot of you guys like. I can't remember which one it was, but um, it actually breaks it down into the three levels. So so it's actually using, it's pretty much using what it's getting from the satellite, okay, as, as an initial condition, and then it, it does a forecast from that. Most of them only do just, just percentage of sky cover. So they're not super useful for, for telling you whether there's going to be high clouds or low clouds. Some of them are, but most of them are not. So, um, okay, I mentioned the apps, and Jeremy gave me, I, I don't remember the names of those apps. Clear outside. Clear, clear outside. I think that one uses the dark sky model, I think. And then there was another one called Astro something. Astrospheric. Astrospherics, and that was using the RDPS model, which I think is Canadian, isn't it? Yes, yeah. Yeah. So, Generally, as, as a meteorologist, you should never just rely on one model, you know. Um, so, so that's why that's why I, I tend not to, not to use the apps very much because I'm looking at all the models. So anyway, um, all right, so, and I'm not sure how to get this to play. 
Right, right. Usually put in the center. Put in the final. Yeah, but, okay, yeah. Okay. So I, I just did a, a model plot uh, and got the, all, the different models in this in this one website that I go to a lot. Uh, and I showed all the different models that what they were showing for cloud cover. So you look at this and they're, they're pretty close, but, um, so how did you play that again? It is clicked inside the window. There you go. Yep. Okay, so you saw that one, that first model, it showed cloud cover everywhere. These are showing cloud cover really breaking up. And let's see, what's the time for this? This is for 7 p.m. 7 p.m. Eastern time. Is, is the, the forecast that, that, that this is giving you. So some of these actually did pretty good because as, as I was driving down here, it was starting to clear up, you know, but then you got some of those others that are showing like total, total cloud cover. So, and that's the, that's the trick with forecast models. They, some of them are better than others for certain things. And some of them have, you have to, you have to understand the, the weaknesses and the strengths of all the models um, to, to perceive that. Um, Okay, this is another one I want to play. So, the Weather Service actually has a uh, really nice website that you can do a lot of stuff with. It. So, what I did there was I went and I clicked right in the middle of Montgomery County. Okay, and that brought up this forecast for the center of Montgomery County. And you can either look at this graph, okay, that middle graph right there where I'm clicking now includes sky cover. Okay, a little bit hard to read here, but there's there is a sky cover percentage um, for every hour from the weather service. Okay. And again, the guys at the weather service are real honest to goodness meteorologists, and they're looking at all the models and basically come up with coming up with a forecast based on their interpretation of the models. So I would recommend actually if you if you want to use a, a real meteorologist produced forecast, go to something like this. So what's the URL? Well, it's weather.gov. Weather I, I did weather.gov slash PHI, and that bring it, brings you to the Mount Holly, Philadelphia uh, forecast area. And then you can click on whatever area you're interested in. You can also put in a zip code. You can put in a location name. You can do all sorts of stuff. But I, I wanted to get to the clickable one, and you go to slash PHI to get there. How am I doing on time there, Jeremy? Very good. Okay. All right. So yeah, so I mean, I mean, I think this is a good sky forecast, but again, it's percentage of cover. You know, maybe not what astronomy people are looking for, but but it's but it's good and it's good forecast and it's produced by people who who do forecast. So, uh, so what would you do if you want to go out? Um, I would recommend before you make your final go no go decision. You do some of this stuff. You check the ASOS data. All the ASOS data is mostly available on the internet. I'm saying that now because one of my favorite ones is the Potsdam ASOS. And it's there, but it's not communicating with the internet. So I can't get the data from that unless I call them up on the phone and you get a recording. But you, know, you can still get the data, but it's a lot harder to check than just look, going to the internet. Um, most of these ASOS units are total, totally automated. So sometimes like they'll, they'll actually read the cloud cover and they'll read the cloud cover and, and right above them, it's, it's clear. But it's mostly cloudy when you, when you look, you know, from, from horizon to horizon, it's mostly cloudy. But this, this automated unit just basically says, oh, it's clear, you know. So, so it's, it's a little bit, you, you sort of have to understand what's going on. And so you need to look at other stuff. You can't just look at the ASOS data. Um, and they're, they're, they're oriented towards what planes need, what aircraft pilots need, what aircraft needs. So um, they're not for astronomy. So anyway, I would look there. I would also look at uh, some, uh, some of the satellite data. Like I said, the newest goes um, units. There's a lot of good things that they get out of those 12 to 14 channels that they can combine and get a lot of really cool pictures. And there's the URL for the um, for what I use. There's a lot of ways to get to the data, but I use that weather.cod.edu slash satrand. Uh, and that, that takes me basically right to the satellite data. Okay. 
So for example, this is the daytime, what do you call it? The daytime crowd cubes is, is what this, this thing is called. And it's zooming in right on Pennsylvania. And you can see at uh, whatever time that was, I just grabbed an image. Um, um, okay, so that was 2317 Zulu. Um, so that was basically yesterday. Wait, no, that can't, that, no, that can't be. Okay, 1751 Zulu, that's it. So 1751 Zulu, which is uh, noon, basically, noon to one o'clock. Okay. And so at noon to one o'clock, if you look at like where we are, you know, it's mostly cloudy. It's not, it's not overcast, but it's mostly cloudy. There's a lot of clouds. And you can get a really good, good idea of what's happening there. The other thing that I like about this one, you can see all the color coding, which doesn't help the colorblind people like me a lot, but there is like, if you have actual snow on the ground in a clear sky, you can tell it's snow because of the color coding. I think it's gold or green or something like that, but it's it's, it's really really very obvious. Um, what you used to have to do is you used to have to take the, the visible satellite and animate it and see what what doesn't move and that's snow. But you know, at least now you have the color coding which helps. Okay, this is another one that I really like, and this is nighttime microphysics. Okay, again, it's color coded. Uh, with the nighttime microphysics, you can figure out where there's fog. Um, where there's really high clouds, where there's medium clouds, low clouds. Um, you know, when there's actual clouds that are producing rain, they usually usually look, I think it's red, but you know, and sometimes um, when there's when there's lightning in the clouds, you can actually see see little speckles where the lightning's happening and that kind of stuff. So so it's actually pretty cool. And you can see right there in the middle of Pennsylvania, there was a clear slot in whatever time this was. Let me see what time this is. That was um, 3.21 ETC. So that was 10 p.m. last night. Okay. So 10 p.m. last night, if you were in, where, where's that dark sky site you guys are trying to go to? Yeah. Potter County is. So, yeah, not quite a clear sky there, but yeah. Um, I, the, the nice thing about this is it does show the thinner clouds. Like you can see that there, even though I said it's clear, you can see a couple of streaks where there are some clouds that are happening. So. Okay, and I just wanted to bring this up. It's not just clouds. Yeah. Um, smoke has been a big issue over the last couple of years with all the wildfires. You know, and when, when you have a smoky atmosphere, you look up and it looks sort of milky, you know, because you have the smoke that's in the atmosphere. Uh, dust, uh, especially with the, um, the dust bowl situation that's been going on in the, in the great, the, like the, the high plains, western plains area, there's been a lot of dust bowl conditions. So there's a lot of dust in the air that, uh, you know, will also cause you not, to not be able to see things as well as you might want to. Um, another another place we get a lot of dust from, but it, it really affects more um, uh, tropical weather. Is you get dust off of the Sahara, and it goes out into the ocean, and really really impacts the the actual tropical weather, which is a for a topic for another presentation. If if, if I wanted to put that together, but but at any rate, there's a lot of ways you can get dust that's going to going to hurt your visibility and hurt your weather. You know, affect your weather. Uh, weather, uh, how, how the weather uh, progresses, basically. The dust is going to tend to, uh, tend to suppress things a little bit, okay? And then haze, and haze, um, it's, re it's really pollution-induced, but, you know, you, you know what a hazy sky looks like, and you can get that, too. Um, all right, so those are the, like, some of the other ways that your vision can be obscured in the atmosphere. I don't want to go into too much detail with those, but just know that they're there. There are ways to like um, figure out if there's smoke that, that, that you're looking at or, or a couple other things. But, um, but in general, those are the kinds of things you need to worry about. 
uh, turbulence forecast. And th this one was a surprise to me that Jeremy told me that turbulence is, a, is, is an issue for astronomy. I did look, read up on it and okay, I understand now, but I didn't, I didn't even think of that back then. But, you know, turbulence, if it may, Hey, it may actually cause clouds, but a lot of times you get the clear air turbulence, okay? And um, some of the ways that you can get clear air turbulence, uh, orographic effects, I keep using that term, hopefully, hopefully it makes sense to people, but it's basically terrain effects, okay? So if, if wind goes over a mountain, uh, after it goes over the mountain, there's probably gonna be turbulence, okay? It might be weak, it might be strong, but there's gonna be some turbulence there typically. Um, so that's your orographic stuff. Um, atmospheric convention. So if you have cloud, cumulus clouds, you might have a little bit of turbulence by the cumulus clouds. Thunderstorms, there's almost always turbulence in and around the thunderstorms, which is why planes avoid, avoid problems with thunderstorms. One of the reasons. Uh, and then one, one of these, which is like, you know, it's not that hard to forecast, but it's sort of hard to, to actually visualize is that the jet stream, and everybody's familiar with the jet stream, I'm sure you see it on TV and everything, and they talk about the jet stream. Well, the jet stream is, is zipping around the uh, the Earth, and in the nor northern hemisphere, you have, actually, there's a lot of jet streams, but the, the one that most people around here think about is the, the mid-latitude jet stream, okay? And what happens is, at, to the north of that jet stream, especially if it's a trough, um, you're going to get a lot of turbulence there, okay? Um, because the, um, you know, the, that's, that's just where a lot of things are happening in the jet stream. So, so you're going to get some turbulence there. Um, and uh, there are way, there are forecast sites, but again, all these forecast sites are for, for aviation. So um, it, they'll give you a, at least a starting point but, and give you an idea of where to look for turbulence, but you know, it's one of the harder things to forecast because it's because it is a clear air phenomenon. So um, here's one of the websites. Uh, it did include a URL there, but I'll have to I'll have to send it to you if anybody really wants the URL. But this is the actual turbulence forecast. Okay, um, and they usually go for moderate or extreme or, or you know they, they don't usually go for the mild turbulence they usually don't forecast that because it's, it's pretty easy to, for it to happen um but yeah so there is a website a lot of websites but this one right now um that tells you what the turbulence forecast is um and then here's the pilot reports pyreps pilot reports um and, and this is one of the things that the pilots like to report if they run into turbulence that, that's that's affecting them enough that, you know, they actually have to do some work, um, they're, they're gonna make that report. So those were all the pilot reports of whatever time this was, um, 19C and 2 p.m. 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. this afternoon, so. So, you know, and, and that's pretty, let's see, oops. Is that close to where the, the forecast was? That's, you know, they got it right in around the Great Lakes, but some of the other stuff, maybe not, not quite so bad. So, you know, it's a tough thing to forecast. Okay. Atmospheric optics. Uh, Jan, I think, I think it was who asked about uh, ice halos. Okay. That comes under the, the umbrella of atmospheric optics. Okay. And generally, atmospheric optics are, if you have moisture, if you have you know, little, little raindrops that maybe don't even look like a cloud, but you have that in the atmosphere, or you have ice crystals in the atmosphere, which may or may not be visible as clouds, you're gonna get these, these atmospheric optics phenomena that happen. Um, and that was a cool picture, by the way, that you showed it earlier. That was, I really like that, but, but at any rate, uh, rainbows, everybody's seen rainbows. Um, and, uh, you know, basically that, that's, that's, they, they, they usually, in fact, they pretty much always are actually rainbows. They're not ice beams, they're rainbows. Yeah. Uh, they, um, you know, and they, they, they happen when the light gets refracted and reflected in, in these, in these particles. 
And so it ends up you, where you see a rainbow. It's pretty cool to see. And you can see double rainbows. I even one time saw a triple rainbow, you know, because they, yeah, they, they were doing enough bouncing around that I got a triple rainbow out of it. But that's pretty cool. The ice halos, the ice halos happen with ice. So they're happening further up in the atmosphere than the rainbows. You know, right? rainbows is, is the, the moisture, the, the liquid. And then as you go up in the atmosphere, you get up more of these ice crystals. Um, they, because of the way they're refracted and reflected and everything, you very often see a, a 22 degree halo. Um, you know, that's thin cirrus, or just, you know, there, there's ice up there that is really a thin cirrus, but you can't really see it. Um, thin cirrus cloud, but you can't really see it. Um, very often they're visible around the sun or the moon. I, you know, I, I think probably everybody's seen it, seen it at night around here where you see this big halo around the moon. You know, I mean, it, it, they happen around here. They happen a lot of places. Um, there are actually a whole bunch of other, other formations of, of these optics, lots of circles and everything else. I'm not going to go into that too much, but, but I did want to bring this up. Well, sun dogs are one of these, that's that's another one in the 20 to 22 degree things. You know, you actually get the, these, uh, you know, it, it really is a, a, you know, a complete circle, but the sun dogs are, are the most visible and that's part of, part of the, uh, the, the optics. Um, but here's a, here's a, Here's a nice halo around the, around the sun. I did steal these pictures, by the way, so I was a bad boy. But, uh, and here's a nice halo around the moon. You know, probably everybody around here has seen that. And certain nights when it's, it's, it looks pretty clear that you'll, you'll see this halo, that means that you got these ice crystals that are moving in aloft and they, they end up forming these, uh, these halos. Okay. So this is like, you see, Somebody asked about sun dogs. This is showing where the sun dogs typically happen. Um, you know, and, and what, uh, see, the various different kinds of ice crystals are going to affect the refraction and reflection differently. And so you get these different effects depending on, what, on which ice crystals are going. So, you know, the, uh, it's, it's where the sun dogs are, that looks like it's, uh, well, it's one of those flat hexagons. But um, but it's but it's oriented a certain way to get that. Why do they call it twenty two degree halo? That's right. What's what, what do you mean? Diameter. Mm -hmm. Well, it, yeah, well the diameter, but basically the, the the these hexagons are actually like sixty some degrees, okay, and the, the actual refraction that goes through it basically comes out at a twenty two degree angle out out of the out of the, the ice crystals. So yeah, I mean to me, I don't know why that why that looks why they're calling that 22 degrees, but that's why. It's because of the the the, the angle of reflection coming out of coming out of these ice crystals. It's all called like almost always 22 degrees. Okay. And there's there's one of the pictures I saw and you can see you know down at the at the millimeter level, you see, you know, 0.1 millimeter. So um, you can see that these, these ice crystals look like, and you got both these, uh, um, and they're almost always hexagonal, but sometimes they're flatter and sometimes they're too, more tubular, but, but they're basically hexagonal. And the, the, the light going through these things reflects, reflects and refracts, and you get all these, uh, um, these effects coming out of it. Okay. So like here, here's a case where they've sort of all lined up and you get you get this, uh, I would call that cloud of luminance, I think they call it, or iridescence is it? Iridescence. Cloud iridescence. Um, yeah, and, but basically, because, again, because these, these ice crystals are actually, sometimes they're not suspended, sometimes they're falling. And when they fall, they also orient in the same, same direction. And so you get the, these certain effects that happen because of oriented in the same direction. Not always the case. Okay, so that so that's it for the clouds. And since the last time I was here at DBAA, um, I was at Fort Washington. I wanted to cover this real quickly if I had time. Um, so, you know, as I said, I, I visited DBAA on July twenty third. 
I wasn't sure whether that was really going to happen because on July 21st, there was severe weather that actually affected Fort Washington. It turns out it affected an area called the Fort Hill section, which is on the other side of the turnpike thing. So, so you, you actually got lucky with that and uh, you know, you were able to hold your event. But then what happened, which I enjoyed by the way, thank you for letting me come. Um, but the, um, what happened was on September 1st, uh, what was left of Hurricane Ida came through the area and it spawned six, eight tornadoes throughout the, uh, the Mount Holly area, okay? And in fact, they were in Pennsylvania and New Jersey I think it was one. Was the one in Delaware? Yeah. No. I thought that the one developed right across the state line. Okay. The one you looked at in Oxford. Right, right. The one in Oxford. I I did the damage survey for the one in Oxford, um, which was rated the EF two based on my damage survey. Um, but anyway, the uh, the September first one, uh, there was considerable damage in parts of the militia hill section. Okay, the pavilion area where we met was in the Militia Hill section, but it was further down from where the damage, where most of the damage was, because there was some damage even in the in the pavilion area. So the Park Service was generally taking the approach that they are not going to clean, clear the stuff out, they're going to let it recover naturally. A lot of it has, I live right next to it. A lot of oh, the okay. trees that are, that got destroyed are actually growing leaves. And yep. I, as, Somebody who lives there, I'm so happy because they have great mega spots in Maple Glen and stuff like that. They took down forestry that just never should have been taken down. Yeah, and yeah. I did watch as the trees leaned out. I pass this every single day. And actually, someone showed you a picture of something that looks like a tornado, which happened in the exact same spot. That picture was taken right there. Okay, I'd love to see that picture because I don't think there were a lot of pictures of this tornado. Uh, that same day, there, there was the, the EF3 that hit Monica Hill, and there's tons of pictures of, of, of all of that. But this one, because it was an EF2 and you know, it was one of many, it didn't get as many pictures. So I'd love to see any pictures that anybody wants to send to me. Um, but at, at any rate, the, uh, the, the part of the Militia Hill section that got hit the hardest that I could find and I, I, I have not done a complete damage survey, but the there's a place where there's the, the bird uh, viewing platform. And just down from the bird bird viewing platform, there was like a whole grove that got, you know, got like there were trees that were down, there were trees that were uprooted, there were trees that were, uh, the tops were ripped off of them. So that area got hit, hit really hard. But uh, luckily at the Militia Hill section, it didn't get hit too hard to work on. There was some minor tree damage, but as far as I could tell, like the pavilions and everything didn't get hit. Uh, I think they had to clear a lot of the trees out because they have that, uh, that Frisbee golf, disc golf uh, course that's there. And they had to clear out some of the trees because, to, to make that usable again. Ambler's horticultural stuff got really fast. There okay. were trees that were, are very rare and stuff. They got Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Amble or hold Okay. Yeah. Right there. That got, right. Temple got trapped. Yeah. I, I can believe. Um, what was the other thing I was going to say? I mean, basically, the, uh, well, I'm going to show you some pictures, basically. But, um, this was the actual surveyed path of the tornado. Okay. So the tornado started down. Uh, south of Fort Washington State Park, but not by much. Okay, and it was doing some minor damage. And you can see, if you look on here, there's those little uh, little triangles. Those are areas where they actually looked at damage. Okay, they, they, there's no way that they can look at everything that gets damaged and write it up. So they they do basically they, they do spot checks on areas. And a lot of times it's the actual emergency management staff that are out there showing them the damage that they're aware of. Um, so you can see there's not a lot of, there, there's a one, the one damage, uh, a couple of damage things that were in the park, but um, in fact, that one there that I circled was in the park. Uh, and then the, the arrow that I drew there, sorry, sorry about the poor, uh, poor drawing, but I'm not really good at drawing with the mouse, but at any rate, that where that arrow is, that's where the, that's where the bird viewing sanctuary is, that bird viewing platform is. 
and where a lot of the trees were were, were really devastated. Um, so anyway, um, that is like right near the, the pavilion area. Okay, that's a, that parking area with the angle parking and everything. Um, and it, this is not a great picture, but if you look in the back, you can see that there's like a, a big tree limb that's there. This was, I think, it was EF zero damage uh, in the rating, but it was the beginning of where the tornado was hit, basically. So it still hadn't really ramped up to, to producing the EF two damage. Um, this this is actually right near the pavilion area too, uh, and that that tree was 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 ripped ripped apart. Um, and uh, a little thing about that, like the kind of, what the kind of damage that these tornadoes do to trees. If a tree is uprooted, it's probably going to be EF zero or EF one damage, depending on how deep the root system is and that kind of stuff. If a tree is snapped, that can be as as much as EF two damage. Uh, if the tree looks like it was a really strong tree, it takes more to actually snap the the um, the the trunk than to actually uproot the tree. So, but and the whole. Uh, I'm not going to go too deeply into how they do ratings for these and how they get the rating for all these things, but that's some of the information that they're looking at when they do a survey or that I'm looking at if I'm doing a survey. And it gets really, uh, really interesting. You find stuff and you find, I might find something like this that looks like, uh, you know, that could have been EF2 damage, except when you actually look at the tree closely, it's rotted and it's, you know, so it just snapped because it was, basically it was time for it to snap. You know, so you got you got to assess that when you're doing the rating. Okay, this one here, which is one of the trees that was right there near the, near the uh, bird viewing platform, got uprooted. Okay, uh, it's coming back naturally. You can see that the the, the root ball is actually has stuff growing on it, and so uh, you know, so that's pretty cool. Um, this is the area where the trees were topped, and um, you know, the tops were ripped off. The uh, some of them were uprooted. There's a whole bunch of stuff that happened down there. Yeah, that's right by where that bird viewing platform is. Okay, this is this is another tree right right by where that other one was uprooted, and it looks very similar. Except I, I, I don't know if I put the arrow shot, but the one tree fell uh, to the north. The other tree fell to the south. You know, which is one of the things you're looking for when you're looking for tornadic damage. You're looking for rotation. And if, if things fall in different directions like that, it's it's pretty indicative of rotation. Okay, there you go. This was this is the Fort Hill area. Uh, there's really not much to the Fort Hill area except there were a lot of trees. There's not a lot of trees there anymore. And you can see the uh, trees all fell different directions towards each other. Most of these are uprooted, but there were a couple that were snapped. And the other trick is the one pretty much right in the center of, of this shot, actually came down on July 21st. And I got that information from the park manager. So, so this area got hit really hard by both the straight line winds that happened on July 21st and then the, the tornado that came through later. That was from the What's that? Was that from the derecho? Uh, it, was, it was not from a derecho. July 21st was not a derecho, it was just, that was the remnants of the east one. It was the east one. It, don't worry. But yeah, it was it was it, remnants of another um, tropical system actually came through and, and created some. Uh, we had three. So I live in Amber. We had three that were very close. One was on Bobby Island, and the other one was on Prior to September 1st, and we had another one that hit down in, I watched it actually go overhead, hit down in uh, Lower Grove. That was okay. not this one. All the three actually very close to my home. Yeah, right yeah. to us. Yeah. Everybody near us, you get an alert now on your phone. You actually listen. Yeah. Right. I think the one, the third one you're talking about, Lower Grove, that was pretty much straight line winds. Um, I actually hit one of the places it hit was uh, Wingsfield. Yeah, um, that's where I was. Okay, all right. Yeah, so. Elsa was. So, so I have a thing from the next. Elsa was yeah. the tropical system on the 21st. Yeah, Sorry. I, I have a thing from the net. So, Susie Hur says, I live in Philly near Fort Washington, Route 309. 
and heard what sounded like a jet engine near my house, which turned out to be the tornado on 721, 2021. And, and yeah, <laughs> they, they are noisy. I mean, they're, they're really fast winds, so well over 100 miles per hour winds. <laughs> And so if you're close enough to them, you will hear them. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, but the trick is, and you know, the us weather guys will tell you this, just because you hear that sound doesn't mean it's a tornado. But if, you, if you're close enough to a tornado, you will hear the sound, so. It was very different. When I was amazed yeah. that my cat was actually concerned about the sound because he mm -hmm. usually doesn't care about anything. Yeah, uh, <laughs> very oh, discerning, so very discerning cat. We should take it with us when the sun chase. Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, I, um, I, I showed the path earlier, but I didn't actually get the path length. But it was miles, it was doing damage for miles. Um, so yeah, and the, and a lot of these do miles. I think the uh, the Oxford one I did was 10 miles, yeah. Um, and you got one guy doing a survey in a couple of hours, you're not going to see everything that happened all those 10 miles. So you got to do spot, spot checks and that kind of stuff. Anyway, um, the good news is 2022 really had almost no uh, tornadoes. There was one tornado in Bedminster in Bucks County in March, I think it was. And then there were a couple in uh, New Jersey. But a lot calmer this year, which was well, this past year, which was great because <laughs> it was just nuts. I mean, we 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 got we got beat up in 2021. Okay, uh, okay. There's uh, I, I don't know if I mentioned this one. I I did a TV program, a TV interview with a, a meteorologist at Channel 29, and uh, it was at Fort Washington State Park, and. The, the park manager said I was allowed to put my drone up. Because generally, you're not allowed to put drones up in most state parks, but I got permission to put this up. So this is some of the some of the, the tree damage right there in Fort Washington State Park. Right. And this is the one that I was telling you about, the trees that fell in opposite directions. I don't know how, how visible that is, but if you look at the top, you see a tree that's pointing to the left of the, the screen. You know, the root ball is to the right, the tree's pointing to the left. You know, if you look closer to the bottom, you see, you see a tree that's pointing to the right and the root ball is to the left. Okay. If I was out doing a damage survey, I'd, go, I'd look at that and say, okay, it was a tornado. Uh, the trick is you can't just do that because you're also trying to get the EF scale, the strength scale, strength rating. But basically, I would immediately call that a tornado just, just by that picture. So and drone footage really helps with stuff like that because uh, otherwise I have to look at both trees and, you know, do some geometry and everything to figure out how the trees fell. This is a, a straightforward picture that just for Okay. Um, questions, I guess the one thing, and Jeremy sort of mentioned it, um, a couple other people are familiar with it. There is a program called Skywarn, uh, which the National Weather Service runs. And um, because of some limitations they have, like the radar goes up a mile, um, you know, they don't always have, they don't have instruments everywhere. Sometimes they don't see the severe weather. So they have a network of spotters um, that they train. <laughs> and then you, if you're a trained spotter and you observe severe weather, you can report it to them. And it's a, it's a very good program. It used to be extremely necessary because people didn't have cell phones and that kind of stuff. So it used a lot of amateur radio. Nowadays, people have cell phones, they have Twitter, they have Facebook. So they get a lot of data any, you know, on a daily basis, they get a lot of data. The trick is most of those people who are sending in data are not trained. So they have this training program. If anyone's interested in it, um, I'd be glad to either do a presentation for a group or whatever, or, you know, I could give you more information on it. And with that, any more questions? Go ahead, Lou. So I, have, so, I have two questions from the, the net. Firstly, uh, can the Redison, uh, is it Ray Winson, Ray Winson uh, balloon packs be recovered by using a tracking device like Apple AirTag so that they can be reused? Hey, we well, even want it. Uh, well, I'm sure that that, that that could be done. They don't do that. And they, again, they, they, make, they put these things together cheaply enough so they don't oh, really yeah. care if they get them back. 
Yeah, but yeah, you know, I mean, it's sort of, three I mean, ounces per stir. Yeah, yeah, right. So, and then as a, a second question, is all the GOES satellite data for continental U.S. downloaded to the NOAA uh, NESDIS radar station at Wallop Island, Virginia? I, I believe they are. Okay. Uh, I mean, over the U.S. itself, yeah, it goes east and goes west. I don't think we have another one. But they're constantly putting up satellites because these satellites don't last forever. So we have to replace them. Got it. And uh, right now, I think, well, I think we actually have three up there now because it goes west is being replaced. There was a new one. I just read something yeah. about it. And, and, and that's re I think that's replacing goes west, which is interesting because goes west was, was like the newer one. Yeah. So they had problems with it, so they're sending up another satellite to replace it. So, uh, yeah, so close to it. Um, in the place we go, uh, a lot of places we uh, do astronomy, they're pretty remote. And obviously most of the weather stations are in the populated areas, right? So we're in, for example, our favorite place, Cherry Springs, the I think the, the closest weather stations are one of them 17 miles away, another one's 12 miles away, and the elevation change is different. So how good are they at, at uh, inter interpolating the information between weather stations in a situation like that? Seems like they're terrible. <laughs> well, well it, and the, the, the answer I'm going to give you is it depends. <laughs> depends on what, what's happening with the weather. Um, which direction it's coming from, you know, but, but they but they know the terrain, you know, when, and, and they take that into account. Uh, the, the trick is, you know, weather models are only as good as two things: the data that gets that um, that gets into them, and sometimes there's errors in the data, um, and um, how good the map is that they do it. Now, uh, there's other things which, like, some of the models have a 13 kilometer grid point. So each point is 13 kilometers apart. There's other models that I think they're down to like three now, right? Yeah. Okay. But most of most of the model, the three kilometer model actually runs every hour. Uh, but there's like a the 13 kilometer model runs four times a day. Um, you know, so again, that's an older model. So as they get newer stuff, they can run them more often. Um, they can get you know more information. The trick is. You know, you'll, it, it's a three-dimensional, and some people would say four-dimensional problem. You need to understand what's happening up in all directions and what's what's going to happen over time. And no model is perfect at that because it doesn't have a complete picture of what's going going on. Okay, which is what you're running into. You, you know, you've got these these weather stations 20 miles apart. A lot can happen. You know, so so yeah, so so weather models are. Uh, are, are, you know, they, they do what they do. They're not perfect, and that's why you have people that actually look at this, look at all the various models. You, you saw that with the cloud, with the cloud cover. I know I'm not on camera. I guess I should put back on camera. Right? <laughs> yeah, you know, with the cloud forecast that I showed earlier, I, I showed like six models, and each one of them had a different picture, okay? Somebody's got to look at that and figure out which one's right, okay? One of the things that, that really annoys weather people is one of the models, the GFS model, which on TV, a lot of times they call it the American model, it'll go out to 380 kilometers, okay, which is, it's a long time. It's what, two weeks? Yeah, okay. That model doing things two weeks out is horrible, <laughs> you know? So you, you'll never see a really honest to goodness, reliable forecaster saying much about the 384 hour model because it's just not that reliable. You know, um, the further out you get, you get rounding errors, you get all sorts of stuff that happens and these models just don't perform real well. Sorry, Ed. The tornadoes and, and other severe weather, are they part of a long-term uh, increase in severe weather or is it just typical tornado fluctuation? They, they, no one is actually, the question was about uh, whether the, the severe weather that we've been getting more often around here recently, if it's uh, what, so, no, just, the, Well, what you were talking about, is that part yeah. of the trend towards more severe weather? Is it a trend towards more severe weather or is it just sort of the yeah, random fluctuations? There's a lot of people here who are familiar with central PA. 
And some of you are probably old enough to, to remember 1985. Uh, in 1985, there was a major tornado outbreak that went through the northern half of Pennsylvania, uh, like a whole lot more than what Ida feels. Okay. The only, back then they were not doing the EF scale, they were just doing the Fujita scale, the F scale. Uh, that's the only tornado that hit Pennsylvania that got an F5 rating. Five is the highest rating. Okay, that's only ever happened once in Pennsylvania to get a five. Um, but there were, I don't even remember how many tornadoes, but most of them were, were F4 tornadoes, which the difference between F4 and F5 means that it didn't hit any really big buildings, basically. You know, so the F4 is like, there was one F4, and I know I'm getting way off of what the actual topic is, but there was one F4 that uh, went through Black Moshannon State Forest. But, well, Moshannon State Forest is right near Black Moshannon State Park. Um, and it ripped down thousands of trees. And it was ripping them down with such force that the seismograph at State College was registering the, the collisions with the Yeah. So that one very possibly could have been another F5 if it, if it had hit anything that would give it an F5 rating. That's that's the problem with the F scale and the EF scale. Got to hit some. Yeah, so, yeah. I don't have a question about severe weather, but typical weather, like maybe for half a day, you look up and you see clouds and they're at thousands of feet up. Okay. Is there, in general, a dramatic effect that takes place once they're in their shadow? Like, is there a, a change that you could say, in general, the clouds become denser or something, or, or maybe they become lower or higher? Well, I mean, there, there are diurnal effects in the yeah. atmosphere that do all sorts of things. Okay, clouds is one of the things that would affect. And I'll be honest, I haven't really, I don't have the detailed answer to what you're saying. But yes, it, as, as the as the Earth warms and cools, it warms during the day and cools at night. I'm talking about direct sunlight. I, I, well, but that's how the Earth warms is with direct sunlight. Yeah, you know, I mean that's one of the things that that you know. These weather models take into account is what time of day it is, how cloudy it is, et cetera, et cetera. And that all goes into the, the models and all goes into the, you know, the, the uh, meteorologists figuring out what's going on. Um, I, and I just don't know. And I don't know if Ed knows. Yeah, I mean, in typical warm weather, warm season day, you'll see that those cumulus clouds will come up because of surface heating. You know, if there's enough ascent forcing a loft or a trigger, a cold front, sea breeze, and like you'll see them build. But as you lose the heating of the day, it's losing that, you know, ability for fuel for ascent. So right. as the surface cools down faster than air above it, it'll kind of, you'll see yeah. that disappear. Yeah. And, and that's the point so I mentioned convective effects. The convective effects are a big part of what, you know, especially when you see the cumulus clouds and that kind of stuff. It's convective. Okay, and the convection, um, convection happens when it's warm down here and cold up there, okay? And something pushes the air up, because the air doesn't doesn't really want to go up unless it's pushed up or pulled up, okay? So the convection, if you see cumulus clouds during the day, you have convection. Um, if you see thunderstorms, you have really strong convection there. But, you know, you have the, these little, and convection happens pretty much whatever it's on. Uh, you don't always get the clouds out of it, but you, you know, you do have, because the earth, the earth surface heats up quicker than, than everything else, okay? And the, the, the land masses heat up quicker than the ocean, that's another thing, that's one of those differential heatings and sea breezes and all that stuff happening because of that. that. So when, when the sun goes down, uh, what typically happens is the, the Earth's surface, actually, the temperature really starts dropping, okay? And so when the temperature on the, on the, the land surface drops, okay, you're sort of losing the push for the, for the convection, okay? You may not lose it because if it's really, really cold in the upper atmosphere, you might still get convection. You might get some really strong convection. So but but sort of over, you'll see them on TV say, okay, we're losing the heat of the day, so these storms are going to die out. 
And that's why that's really what they're trying to say is that the ground's starting to cool down. So you're, you're, you're starting to stabilize. Yeah, like one thing that I've noticed in particular is it's clear out, and then you set up your scope and everything when you're out, and then like an hour or so after sunset, you get those thin clouds that just start to materialize up there. And is that something that would be expected? And you know, kind of related to that, also, even when you have total solar eclipses, you can get cloud formations and things just from the temperature change. <laughs> oh, I'm no, sorry. <laughs> Want to take handle that one? Um, yeah, I mean, sometimes it's there and you just can't during the day. Uh, see, they'll be what they call synoptic scales. So your big weather system, and a lot of times that ahead of it, or due to the jet stream, or ahead of a big trough, you'll see there'll be clouds streaming in with warm air advection ahead of you know ahead of approaching system, and that's a lot of times you see you know, the ice halos and the like. So, yeah, it's it's not especially at our latitude that's not uncommon, and it's more readily apparent at night. But yeah. Cool. Yeah, to add to what it said, I mean, that's more than that. Did I kill it? It's, it's on. Okay. okay. Yeah, as, as you know, sorry, what was that? What was the story? Oh, yeah. I mean, you, you um, in the daytime, it's a lot harder to see those, uh, you know, what, what the ice crystals are doing to you. It's a little bit easier to see it at night. And we're in the mid latitudes. Mid, mid latitudes is where. A good chunk of the weather happens a lot. Okay, so there's very, you know, except in cases where you have a blocking, you know, so the upper atmosphere is preventing things from from reaching you. Um, if you if you don't have a blocking thing, you got systems coming through every couple of days. You know, so so you're going to run into that. But anyway, you got up, so I I just so I'm not permanent, right? I <laughs> <laughs> we have one last question. Anybody? I have one from the net. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you, in a nutshell, explain what caused the recent devastating snowstorm in Buffalo? <laughs> in a nutshell. In a nutshell, it's a leak effect. Oh, okay. Oh, oh wait, are you talking about the first one or the second? Uh, I have no idea. Okay. Well, yeah, probably the most recent one. Um, Which everyone was bad. Yeah. I mean, like, Lake effect snow, I could do a, a lot of stuff with lake effect snow. But what happens is if the lakes are not frozen over yet, or not mostly frozen over, they are a good source of moisture, okay? They're also a good source of convection, okay? Because, you know, the, the, this cold air goes over the over the, the lake, and so it wants to rise, okay? Um, and uh, it... Um, you get a lot of snow out of them, you know. I mean, that's that's lake effect. This most recent one was actually part of a bigger system, uh, but you know, sometimes you get the lake effect snow and there's no real, you know, really strong system that's happening. It's just the way the winds are going and the fact the lakes the lakes are still liquid, they're still warm. So cool, but thank you, thank you. Go on. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Really appreciate your talk. Okay, everyone, did you have any last words, Jeremy? No. Okay, I guess we can say goodbye to our visitors on YouTube. Thanks for joining us, and thanks, everyone, for coming, and we'll see you next month. <laughs>